Hello everyone, and welcome back to the final 2018 Small Farms Winter Webinar Series, hosted by the University of Illinois Extension's Local Food Systems and Small Farms team. This is Zach Grant back again on moderating duties for your final webinar of the season. And we are really excited to have you back for the rescheduled, less common uh, fruit bearing plants that's going to be presented by Dr. Elizabeth Wally here in a second. We really appreciate you joining us for these webinars, and we're going to do our best to begin and end within the space of this lunch hour. This is a very tight time frame for our educators to deliver the, the information that they're going to deliver. So we're going to limit your questions to the text box like usual. And if uh, we can answer uh, in the middle of the webinar, that's fine. But we prefer to answer the, the questions towards the end of the webinar unless um, Dr. Wally feels uh, like she can answer it in, in midstream. But we don't want her to get too distracted so we can get through uh, this this um, great information. Uh, this presentation is being recorded as usual and we will email a link to the archive presentation as soon as possible after the program concludes. There will also be a very short online evaluation as usual after this presentation and we very much appreciate your feedback. Uh, this week's presentation is from Dr. Elizabeth Wally. Elizabeth is our commercial ag extension educator for the University of Illinois Extension. She's housed in the Madison and Monroe St. Clair unit in southern Illinois, but she also has statewide uh, responsibilities now as a commercial ag educator. She provides leadership in food uh, crop horticulture research and extension programming with a special emphasis in commercial fruit, vegetable, and horseradish production. She earned her PhD in horticulture with a focus in weed science from the University of Illinois and holds a bachelor's degree in commercial hort from Purdue and a master's in hort from University of Illinois. Uh, she carries out a, a lot of applied research and demonstration trials on food crop horticulture in southern Illinois and carries her extension program to a variety of horticulture related groups on fruit and vegetable production. In addition, she coordinates the Gateway Small Fruit and Vegetable Conference and Horseradish Growers Conference and plays a key role with the Illinois Specialty Growers Agritourism and Organic Conference. Elizabeth was also, way back when, before I got started with the extension, one of the very first people to uh, allow me to present my master's research data and kind of set me off on my path with extension, so I really appreciate that. Uh, Elizabeth is also often our go-to, uh, our team's go-to for all things fruit crops, so we're really excited to learn more about some potential unusual fruit crops that might provide a niche for your operation, a very interesting topic to end this year's webinar series. So with that, I'm going to let uh, Dr. Elizabeth Wally go ahead and take it over from here. Hey, thanks, Zach. Today I'll be introducing a number of minor fruit crops, um, and they're considered hardy in much of Illinois, if not the entire state. Uh, if you recognize this fruit pictured on the cover of the slide, you most likely are familiar with the loquat. I want to point out that uh, this is a good example of a fruit that I won't be covering today because it's not quite hardy in Illinois, but there are quite a few number of fruit crops that I'm going to mention at the end of the presentation that may be adaptable to container culture, so bringing it in and out uh, annually. So many of the fruit discussed today have had very little research on production practices, um, cultivar selection, or economic viability. And so for most especially specific to the Illinois growing conditions. So what we're saying is uh, we're aware of them. Um, we have some experience ourselves growing them. But we really don't have a good, strong research basis like we would something like an apple or a peach. So what I'm presenting today is a brief sketch containing information gathered from what scant research has been done and personal observations from me and colleagues who have grown these crops. So all of the crops today, I believe, have value. Um, all are edible. Some are considered superfood. Some provide ornamental value. And many are prized by wildlife. So given that, you might ask me why they're considered minor crops then. And as the title suggests, maybe less common. While some of those qualities of taste are not immediately appreciated, or they maybe require an acquired taste, while others are not usually eaten fresh and thus kind of require some additional processing. So I'm going to somewhat talk about that as we go along. So today we'll introduce less common fruit, and maybe in the future some will be less so. So let's go ahead and start off with currants. You know, currants are interesting in the United States in that they were once very popular. Uh, we have a native population of black currants. But due to an American federal ban in the early 1900, current production was curtailed nationally uh, for nearly a century. 
uh, in an attempt to control white pine blister rust within the timber industry. And as a result of that, the fruit today remains largely unknown in the United States. Now, the federal ban was eventually shifted to the jurisdiction of individual states in the mid-60s. And, and in those states where they have now allowed production, uh, currants are starting to regain some popularity in that. And so one of the main things that I want to point out is if you're considering currants, that one of the number one considerations is that you look at cultivars that are actually noted of having uh, resistance to white pine blister rust because it is an alternate host to the disease. Uh, it is a killer of white pine. And so states that have a very strong industry of white pine uh, most likely still have members of the Ribes family um, restricted and, and don't allow. Illinois does allow uh, currants and gooseberries. Gooseberries are another crop that could potentially um, uh, harbor or be an alternate host to this. So when we talk about the current itself, it is a small bush that uh, produces chains of fruit. Most common ones are going to be the black ones, but there are also red currants and white currants as well. They have um, their own unique small fruit. They are desirable in flavor when you eat them fresh. They have somewhat of a tart nature and become very good uh, when sugar is added to them. So anything that adds um, you know, sugar, things like jellies, wines, juices are added as an ingredient into um, you know, food, food dishes and things like that. One of the nice things about this crop in terms of statewide, you see that I have it rated as zones four through six. Um, as we get warmer in the state, this is a crop that is very amenable to growing in shade. So if you have production areas that are limited for full sun, um, but you have some shady areas, this crop is very amenable uh, to shade production. And so when I mention, I don't want to stick on this uh, real long, but the main thing that I want to point out again is that when you're looking for cultivars, um, your number one thing that you want to look for is that white pine blister rust, particularly if you have white pines in the area. And so um, we have it both, uh, you should be able to find for both black currants, red currants, and white currants as well. So just to show you what white pine blister rust looks like, again, this isn't going to be about the disease itself. I just want to show you a picture. But it does show up on both um, pairs, that uh, alternate host and host. And so on the underside of the leaves, you can get the rust pustules. And on the tree that actually kills a tree, um, you get water soaking and the rust pustules as well. So again, make sure that you get cultivars that have resistance. Now, gooseberry is another relative. And again, um, because of the ban, it somewhat lost its favorability as well. This used to be a very favored pie crop and, and very, very amenable to our growing conditions. So zones three through eight. This again is a small shrub, and we have one of our coworkers standing in front. This is a group of four uh, group gooseberry plants in the lower picture. The colors range um, from red uh, to light green, which they usually call yellow, even though it's somewhat of a light green, but it's a yellow color. And they are small, grape-sized fruit that, when eaten fresh, have somewhat of a tart nature. Um, it's one of my favorite uh, pie fruits. Uh, gives you that really good tart sweet when sugar is added to it. And so very productive when grown on a good site. Um, I will say that these have thorns on them, some more so than others. They're actually prickles. And so during harvest, uh, there um, has to be some consideration for prickles if you're doing you pick or something uh, to that effect. Like uh, the currants, um, they do have different types. We have American types, which are the natives here. They tend to be smaller fruited. And I've given some examples of the types that are fall in this category. European types tend to be uh, much larger in size, better flavored. And that's not always. You know, everything can have um, good and bad. But in general, uh, they're considered better flavor and larger. And we have groups. And then there are also types that are crosses between the two that I've given examples there. 
And so, you know, even with gooseberries, we still need to make sure that there is resistance to white pine blister rust. So I'm just using this as another reminder, and these are examples of some cultivars that we um, have documented that have resistance to the disease that would be um, preferable in an area where white pines are located. Now we also have some crosses, and the first one is Jostaberry, and this is a cross between a gooseberry and two different species of black currants. Um, to date, uh, this seems to be highly resistant to white pine blister rust. Um, just like the gooseberries and the currants, it seems to do well uh, in shade and is productive. Um, I would assume that in cooler regions that full sun would be more productive, but for those of us who are in really warm climates down the southern part of the state, um, shade will still give you some production. This is a thornless plant, unlike its gooseberry parent. Uh, the fruit are very deep black uh, in color, uh, tart in flavor, born more singly like gooseberries, unlike its current parents. Um, and so they're harvested individually. They don't ripen uh, evenly on that. They do have good flavor, um, but, but tart. This is another um, small type of shrub. If we look at uh, resistance to white pine blister rust, um, again, black currant gooseberry hybrids, the Josta, which is also Jostaberry or Oris 8, um, are noted to have resistance. I'll move on to our next that we're going to discuss, and this is hardy kiwi, uh, zones 4 through 9. I'm going to describe this as a very um, strong growing perennial vine that requires a fairly stout uh, trellis system for support. Uh, for people that have grown this, um, many people make comments on how aggressive it does grow. Uh, so I'll make the suggestion that uh, the trellis system not be located uh, where it can make contact with trees because it will grab onto uh, others and grow upward. So it's a pretty aggressive viner that takes quite a bit of uh, pruning on it, but it can be maintained uh, within um, the specs that you want it in. Most plants are dioecious, um, meaning that there are male and female plant. There are also plants that um, are hermaphroditic, have, or um, we call those monicious, meaning the plant has both male and female flowers on it. So you'll find those both in the trade, both dioecious and monicious type of plants. It takes about five years to bring them into bearing and probably another four years before it's in full production. I would liken these to uh, the, the semi-tropical kiwi that you're used to in the grocery store with fuzz. I would like these to be similar in flavor, uh, just don't have the fuzz on the outside. They are a late uh, maturing, so you're not going to be harvesting this until early fall. Some of the notes that we've had on disease, they are relatively disease and insect free, but they are susceptible uh, to sooty blotch fly speck, which is a, a rather common apple uh, summer disease that occurs when we have uh, very humid or wet conditions in the summertime. Uh, so it's a superficial disease, but um, it is kind of a, uh, uh, unappealing in appearance, but uh, is not damaging to the fruit itself. So again, this is a vine crop um, that has some good potential. I was just in a Walmart and I saw that they were uh, selling hardy kiwi now in little um, eight packs of fruit, eight and 12 packs of fruit, so um, becoming more popular. Now as we move into these next ones, this is something that across the board that I want to point out that you need to be cautious of when you're looking at nursery stock when they rate things by their hardiness zone. And so I've got the most recent Illinois map on, on where we have the different zones and then the corresponding what the low temperatures that correspond to those zones. And so one of the things that I want to caution you on is do not get too close to your zone. For example, um, I live in zone six. And so if I were to um, buy plants that were rated hardy to zone six, 
um, I'm kind of at the northern edge of their hardiness. And so if we have a really bad year, um, like we did the winter of 13 and 14, temperatures drop significantly lower than what is average for zone 6. And so we had a lot of uh, dieback and damage to plants that are on their marginal northern edge. So I make that comment for the next few ones because they are only rated to zone 6. And so in our experience with plants like this in the state, for those of you who are in zone 6 and would consider these, um, they need to be in a very protected site and they would not be considered reliable uh, in commercial production. And so when we look at these, and these are very common, you know, when you're looking through catalogs or reading, all these hybrids of the blackberry or the bramble family between blackberries and raspberries. And so that's the loganberry, the boysenberry, the vichberry, marionberry, sylvanberry, tateberry, tumbleberry, and hildeberry. Uh, all of these have um, a hardiness zone um, at the lowest of zone 6. And so for the most part, these are not reliably hardy in the state of Illinois, particularly in the areas that are in zone 5 portion of the state. And so when we look at, just really quickly, to give you some detailed uh, look, boys and Marys, for example, are zone 6 through 9. This is something that we would normally see uh, grown in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, very good. They're managed just like brambles, but again, um, they have um, not reliably winter hardy. So, you know, if you just want to try some, um, you know, to look at them, um, that's fine. But for the most part, we don't consider them commercially reliably hardy. And so when we look at Loganberry, it is the same way. It's another one of the crosses, very similar, but it, it's almost word for word the exact same as the previous uh, slide. So when you're looking at these specialty catalogs that, that sell minor crops, um, um, you'll want to be careful about that. So I have, this is, hey, Mark, that's a good comment. If you look at your um, um, comment section over there, we've got a comment from Mark that's grown hardy kiwi for 20 years in northwest Chicago suburbs. And 50% of the time, because they're so late harvested, they get a frost that actually um, zaps them a bit before they mature. So um, that's kind of the other end of the story, too, on how late some of these um, do mature. So thanks for that comment, Mark. That's good addition. So when we're looking at my next uh, group, and I'm going to say all of these names belong to the same amulancur, but when we are talking about um, this, it is only Saskatoon applied to when we are growing it for eating the berries. And so they have names for when they're ornamental, um, as you see here. But usually when we're talking about something being um, grown for a food crop, they're usually referred to as Saskatoons. And so Saskatoons have good winter hardiness, zones 3 through 9. This is a small multi-stem um, tree or, or, or shrub. Very good fall color for ornamental purposes. So if you're looking for something that, you know, not only is a food crop but has beauty associated, it has beautiful spring bloom and excellent fall color. So I'm going to say that um, when you're selecting cultivars for fruit production, they are usually larger in size than what you see for just the ornamental. So the fruit is not actually a berry, it's a palm fruit. So it is related to the apple. And you want to look for, as I said, improved fruit uh, production. Um, they start out red, uh, the fruit do, and they turn to black when they are ripe. These are very good in pies and preserves. And so this is something that uh, ripens um, in um, midsummer. I will warn you, though, that this is a favorite of birds. So this is almost when you're doing it for food production requires some level of netting because it is very desirable um, as birds. So if we have people that are on board that are looking for um, 
additional sources of food for wildlife, this would be a very good choice as well. Um, this is very adaptable. They do prefer moist, acidic soil in full sun, and by that I mean slightly acidic, not like a blueberry, but slightly acidic. They will take some uh, shade. So um, there's a question, is ornamental service berry also edible? Yes, it is. Um, again, um, the berries are just smaller. Um, they are not selected for um, berry production for human consumption, so they may not be as tasty as some of the others. But yes, um, they are safe to eat and edible. We move on um, to Aronia, um, which has the common name of choke berry. So that's with a B, a choke berry. These again have very good winter hardiness, zones three through nine. There are cultivars that are red or black. The ones that are for um, that are selected for human usually have a tendency to be black berries. This again has um, beautiful uh, fall color and spring bloom, so it has um, very good ornamental value as well. This is one of the berries that's considered. A super, and I shouldn't call a berry. I should call this a palm. So this is again another palm fruit, um, considered a superfood, uh, a mega oxidant. Um, I, you know, it's kind of one of those things. Anytime you see the word superfood and mega oxidant, it doesn't always go along with tasting good. And to me, this is one that is better as a juiced item and added. Um, so it is something that is a. Um, a very good additive for um, its beneficial uh, qualities on it. So um, if I were to rate the berries, I would rate them as firm, um, somewhat mealy. If you've ever eaten an apple that you know doesn't have a crispness to it, it kind of has a mealiness to it, that's how I would describe this, somewhat of a tough skin. Uh, cooking greatly um, improves the texture. I have found in cooking with this, um, when you're not using it for something like juice or a wine um, blender, and those would be cultivars like Nero or Viking, that if you um, add something sour to it, um, that really brings out the flavor and mutes off the flavor. So, you know, a lot of times we talk about adding sugar. This is one that I would say adding sour to when it's not directly being used as a juicer or blender that um, really brings out um, a better flavor in this. If we look at uh, goji, wolfberry, matrimony vine, I believe that when we are uh, uh, harvesting it for its fruit, it usually goes by goji. Um, I've seen quite commonly that you can go into the store where I'm at and buy chocolate covered uh, goji berries. And this is a member of the solanaceous or the nightshade family, so it's related uh, to tomato. This is another one of our superfoods that's high in nutrient and antioxidant content. So um, I would rate the fruit as raisin sized or smaller. When you taste it fresh, it has a sweet tomato, unripe pepper somewhat taste. Uh, to me, it has some of it a bitter aftertaste. So you really get a good flavor up front, but then there's this lingering flavor that's not quite as good. Um, so I'm going to say that it needs to be mixed with something or covered in chocolate, and it is excellent and good for you. Um, it has a number of, um, or I should say it has very good winter hardiness. The plants are various sizes from small to large, um, slightly thorny, some of them more so than others. And um, one of the downsides on this one is it can have similar tomato pest. And so I've got a question the size of good in salads. I would say that, that this is good um, mixed with just about anything because up front it does deliver a good tomato tomatoey flavor. It's when you have something else with it that kind of masks this slight aftertaste that is not quite as pleasant. So I would say um, in experience, yes, it would be something that you can mix it. 
This is something that is juiced as well um, and added to anything that you would add tomato juice. This would be a good juicing item as well. This is one that I absolutely love the flavor of, um, but um, and, and, it, and a lot of them are coming out of breeding programs, different uh, species of this coming out of northern breeding programs, and they're rated in the north as not having very many disease problems or pest problems. We have not found that so as you move down into the warmer climate. We're actually seeing it having fairly significant and, and death of plants due to cherry leaf spot and canker. Um, so it is, um, I'm, I'm not really into you guys jumping into this. This is one that I would just test it um, to see about disease susceptibility because uh, we've had this in research trials uh, elsewhere in other states and they're reporting significant plant loss uh, due to disease, and that again is kind of moving um, into the warmer, warmer climates where conditions are more conducive to it. Um, as I say on the upside, if you're able to grow this, the fruit tastes very good. Um, fruit size is generally half an inch, you know, quarter inch to half an inch. Much, you know, it is a cherry, so much like uh, a typical bright red cherry, uh, ripens early to late summer. You can get them, depending on cultivar, um, tart to sweet. And I'm going to say not quite as good as our traditional tart and, and sweet cherry that we have in cultivation. Um, it has similar uh, stone fruit pests, but it seems to be very susceptible, as I say, um, to leaf spot and cankers in particular. Like our cherries, this seems to be very attractive to wildlife, particularly birds. Uh, so this is, again, um, a medium-sized shrub uh, that can be 9 to 15 feet if you can successfully grow it without disease incident. And so it might have to be um, netted to protect uh, from bird predation. Gumi is one that... I don't have a whole lot of information on other than talking to colleagues on this. And so this is one um, that has, um, I'm going to say a lot of the cultivars are USDA zone 6 through 9, but I am now aware of cultivars that are rated as low as 4. So you might want to add a note um, that there are cultivars that are uh, rated as low as 4, so this might expand um, where this can be grown in the state. The fruit is fairly bright red. Um, the plant itself is considered only partially self-fertile, um, but it produces so much that I'm still saying that it's it's pretty bountiful on a, uh, a single plant from what I'm being told. Comments that I get from people who grow this is as the fruit ripen, uh, it very easily drops, so it shatters rather easily when the fruit is uh, ripe. So this might be one that in the harvest um, mechanization is that there might be um, some method for um, uh, capturing the fruit uh, before it hits the ground. It has, I have tasted it, it is pleasant, um, it has some of a tart flavor, and there's somewhat of an astringency uh, to it when it gets really fully ripe. So um, we have some grape varieties that are like that too, that if you let them get too ripe, they can develop off flavors. This seems to be somewhat like that as well. Has good potential for uses in sauces, uh, pies, jellies, juice, and perhaps wine, uh, though I've not seen anyone try it yet, or I should say I'm not aware of anyone. They might have done it. When we look at figs, um, I'm going to say for the most part, most Figs are something that should be relegated to container production where they're brought in. There are a couple of figs, though, that have hardiness um, rating down to uh, zone 6. Um, both of those are um, zones um, down to zone 5, uh, brown turkey, Chicago hardy. I will say that in trialing them myself, I have found that Chicago hardy um, seems to be um, more winter hardy than brown turkey is. What we see 
in zone six with the harsh uh, winter is that you will see top kill but not kill of the root system. So it will reestablish itself. Depending on when that top kill occurs, you will or will not um, get fruit that year. So I've had it both ways. Um, if we have mild winters, sometimes we can not have top kill. Other times there's top kill and it's just kind of, you know, hit or miss on whether we get fruit or not. So as I say, all other cultivars pretty much need to be container grown. These are absolutely delicious. Um, very difficult to pick them and not just eat them while you're standing there. So they are very good for fresh eating. And so this is an example where hardiness is probably our limiting factor for having it planted in the ground. Um, this would be a very good consideration for a high tunnel, though I will note that this can be uh, a fairly large plant. Even growing in the ground, it easily gets eight feet tall uh, within one growing season, um, starting from being top killed. So it's a, a fairly rapid grower. When we look at elderberries, um, has good winter hardiness, zones four through eight, uh, found across North America. Um, again, uh, berries used in juice, jellies, jams, wine, spirits, flower products, and green, just a whole number of things. Um, so many of you um, might, hey, that I'm, I'm looking at notes if you hear me um, stalling here. Uh, Teacup Farm has made a comment that they're adding about fig has a strong odor when carried over indoors, so um, a strong odor. That's good to know. Mine are all planted outside, so I don't have that. So jumping back to elderberries, um, it has uh, um, a mildly poisonous in the unripe state. And so I have here that cooking or drying dispels the uh, offending substance and greatly improves the flavors. Um, Missouri does have a breeding program, and they have started releasing um, uh, cultivars that I have listed here that are adapted to Midwest growing conditions, so Wildwood, Bob Gordon, and Marge. Um, Missouri is also looking on uh, pruning methods that help in um, placing a uniform crop, and that would be on tops like the American types, Wildwood, Bob Gordon, and also controlling airified mites. Marge, being a European type, is still um, managed in the traditional method. But if you do uh, are interested in elderberry, check out Missouri where they're doing some unique annual pruning um, for uh, management of the fruit crop. If you've ever had honeyberry or hascap, I feel that um, you would um, really enjoy the flavor as well. Uh, the fruit uh, produces an inky blue juice um, that is very good. And so, you know, um, I think that this would be um, very useful uh, for using in place of blueberries without having the issues of the, you know, um, sensitivity of blueberry roots to their rooting environment. One of the things, though, that I'm a little bit hesitant about is how this will do in, you know, hot climates. There's been some question as to whether uh, leaves can be maintained in hot weather. So this might be one, again, to somewhat trial it before you purchase a lot of plants and see how it holds up into your growing condition. I can say, though, that the uh, fruit is very good um, to eat fresh with no off notes on it at all. So um, I have a note from JP that says, I have some of these honey berries seem to grow very slow. Had plants several years and no berries yet. Uh, JP, where are you at? Are you in the northern part of the state or the southern? So as I say, I'm very interested to hear feedback on this. Um, as to what is the leaf retention on these. Um, so you're in the northern part of the state. So um, keep in touch with me. I'm, I'm interested to see how these uh, perform kind of all over the state. I see a note from um, Julie about elderberry just freezing to spell the offending substances too. So yes, cold treatment or cool, cold packing, as they call it, is another method uh, for that as well. 
on that. Um, so on this, um, uh, I see teacup, male and female plants. Uh, I do know that there are two cultivars needed for cross pollination uh, on that. So um, you do, they're not self fertile themselves. So you do need to have two plants on there. Jujube is another plant that tastes great right off of the vine. Uh, we uh, in Illinois are at the absolute northern edge of this, so again, it's another one of these examples of risky. Um, it's exceptionally risky because it's a low chill crop, meaning that it takes very few accumulated cold hours before it's ready to break bud. So, here in Illinois, if you're growing it and it's it's had its 150 hours, it could break with any um, warm up for any period of time. So it's additionally even more so risky than uh, the bramble crosses that I talked about earlier. Um, this can be handled very much like dates. Um, it is a deciduous tree. It does have spines and can usually, when it's happy, grow anywhere from 15 to 35 feet tall. I've not seen any plants even close to this in, in the northern uh, edge of their hardiness zone. Shapova is one that I have tasted and it tastes heavenly. Um, I would say that this is a, a very good replacement for pear because it doesn't suffer um, the fire blight issues that a lot of pear do, but it has a major problem. And if you look at the third point on the slide, it's notoriously slow to start fruiting. It can take up to 15 years. And so this is a partially self-fruitful, uh, meaning standing by itself, it can uh, produce fruit. These are small uh, fruit that are very pear-like, but very sweet. Um, I, I have had them before, and I think they just taste um, quite wonderful on there. So if it didn't have this, you know, slow to get started, um, this would just be probably at the top of my list of something to try. And so if you've got some time uh, that you're willing to wait, this is probably one that you want to look at. So this is um, a cross between two genus of uh, related species. So um, it is the uh, white beam and a European pear cross, but very good. So I only mention it casually because of the 15 years before it even blooms the first time. Chinese haw, I, I was going to jokingly put a big cross through this one. Um, this is an example where I, that I want to draw a point when you're looking in the catalog and you see a nursery say, no known problems. Um, this is an example where I ordered this from a nursery, and that's exactly what they said, no known problems. And maybe where that nursery is, there are no known problems. Um, it's a beautiful tree, comes into fruiting fairly soon. I'm going to say that um, uh, this is something you definitely need to cook or juice, um, because eating it fresh is not very in enjoyable. Birds, definitely, you would have to fight them off for it. The reason I'm putting an X through it as a potential candidate is in our growing condition, it appears to be extremely susceptible to rust diseases. Now, I was in a position to be on a full spray program for control of rust on this, and I had a challenge uh, with keeping it under control. In fact, everybody, all of my neighbors who had cedar trees, all of a sudden had little orange gelatinous you know, telio horns all over their trees, so they look like Christmas trees. And so uh, I actually removed this because it was such a magnet for rust diseases. So um, I have a question from Cheryl. Once Shapova blooms, what are successive bloom time frames? I'm not exactly sure, Sharon, what you mean by that. Maybe you can type something else. I'm going to, while Sharon's typing something in there, I'm going to go ahead with Medlar. 
This happens to be one of my favorite fruits. Now I have this in my planting for my own personal use because I really enjoy it. This is a small tree, self-pollinating. Uh, the fruit are kind of chestnut colored, look like a small app. Well, they really look like a giant rose hip is what they look like. Um, this is a fruit that must be bledded, and so they are not eaten fresh. Um, bledded means that you harvest them hard and bring them indoors and ripen them on the counter until they are super ripe. So think about a banana uh, that you just, it hasn't rotted, but it's just got super ripe. And that's how you handle medlars. And so once, um, once you have them bledded, um, you can just uh, press them through a screen and make a paste. And that paste can be made into jellies or preserves or used in recipes. So I, I use it in a number of recipes um, on there too. So you can, I've made syrups with it. Um, these are very attractive to wildlife. So it's a good thing that you harvest them before they're fully ripe. Um, because the wildlife would definitely take them. I would liken the flavor to a stewed apple. Um, Okay, I'm um, going back to Shapova with Sharon. Will it bloom only once? So yes, it's, very, it's just like any of the apple fruit trees. You get one bloom a year, and it takes a season for the fruit to develop. So every year, once it starts, it should bloom just like an apple, apple tree or a peach tree. So I like I like medlars. Um, downside on it is it's it's not a fresh eating one. Um, I have not experienced any pests, and I'm in the St. Louis Metro East where I would be very conducive to pests. Uh, so the only thing that I've had a challenge with um, is wildlife, uh, like this fruit as well. This is a very common European fruit that has come um, that is not common in the U.S., um, but I, I rather enjoy it. Quince, um, and this is a fruiting quince. This is another tree that... Um, in my grandparents' time, probably would have been much more common. It is a fruit that is very high in pectin and so was very common for making jellies and, and, and different things that required pectin. It is a small, um, very irregularly shaped tree. I am a little bit hesitant to recommend this one as well because um, at Purdue where they have quince, they have fire blight issues, plantings I've had have had fire blight issues, so I'm of a mindset um, that this is susceptible to fire blight. So unless you're buying and they specifically state that it has some form of resistance, um, that should be in the back of your mind that it might be an issue. So this is another one that um, you don't eat fresh. Um, it usually needs to be cooked or you need to um, let it get so ripe like it's bledded, just like I talked about in medlar. So this is not a something that you eat fresh. Wildlife will um, harvest all of them if you leave them hanging on the tree. So they are attractive. This is one sea berry or sea buckthorn. I think it's, uh, we usually stay away from the sea buckthorn because buckthorn has some, un, you know, the buckthorn of itself, the different, the ramness is its genus name, has some undesirable qualities. But sea berry um, is a rather large thorny shrub. Um, the fruit is, um, tastes like when it's juiced, somewhat like tang uh, to me. Has good winter hardiness. I will say that the fruit is very time consuming to pick and the and the shrub can be very aggressive. Um, so when I'm talking about the fruit, it's best used as juicing is because the skin is tough, um, but the flesh is juicy. Uh, so it's, it's that leathery skin on the outside that's kind of hard to go through, but if you juice it, then, then that works very well. Um, Birds really enjoy it as well. So this is another one that I would probably think twice about uh, planting a whole lot of them until I've kind of evaluated how um, how they grow and, and what the growth characteristic for your growing conditions is. Pawpaw is one of our native fruit-bearing trees, uh, hardy zone 5 through 8. This is a small uh, deciduous tree. 
And if you start these, I will, you know, from experience, I've grown a number of these trees myself. I would rate these as when you first plant them, they're, they're somewhat slow to grow for the first few years, and then all of a sudden they take off. And so this is uh, one that you need to protect uh, for a while until they take off. And I would say that's a good, you know, three to four years. They do prefer full sun once established, but it's during that establishment stage um, they benefit from shade. So temporary shade during establishment uh, would be recommended. You do need diff two different cultivars for successful pollination on these. Uh, in nature, as you can see by the flower, they have these blood brown uh, flowers, and that usually signifies that there's some sort of carrion fly. Um, or flies that lay their eggs on dead things uh, that pollinates these. So the, the flowers have somewhat of a unpleasant odor to them to attract these flies um, on there. And so I will say that this is another fruit that, depending on cultivar, might be an acquired taste for some people. Um, they kind of have a mango banana front palate flavor, but they have an astringency that some people find undesirable. Um, I find that they are very good um, in making ice cream, uh, puddings, uh, you know, any anything baked, um, very good, or as I say, ice cream. Uh, wildlife do like these. Um, I grew up ca calling these, you know, possum fruit because possum like them. Uh, so very much. And so this is just one of my examples of what you need to do to extract um, the seed if you're you're just growing from seed. But there's what the fruit looks like. You can see the double row of fruit and the seed on there. But in the process of extracting seed, you can look at it the other way. You're extracting uh, the pulp. So this is the pulp that I extracted from a number of fruit and ran it through a sieve uh, to, to make a nice paste. And it freezes very well. And so you can put this in the freezer and use it when you're ready to use it. So it's a very good puree that can be brought in. Now I have a question. In general, with all these fruits, any issue with bird propagation resulting cross-pollination? Um, I can't say that off the top of my head that I'm aware of any of these um, going through a bird's, you know, intestinal system and then being spread all over the place. So um, as of right now, I am not aware of any. That does not mean there isn't. I'm just not aware of it. Cornelian cherry is a dogwood uh, that produces edible sized fruit. Um, they usually have very good hardiness, zones five through eight. This is a very early bloomer. Mine are in bloom right now. I don't, don't know that the northern part of the state would quite be in bloom, but uh, this is uh, the trees are in full bloom right now. You can buy fruiting types that are red or yellow, depending on the cultivar. They're about the size of an olive. And they have somewhat of a floral sweetness. Um, that's the best way that I can describe them, is that they have a really strong floral aroma to them. Um, like full sun, but will take some shade. It is difficult to keep the birds out of these. So if you're actually growing cornelian cherry for their fruit, you may need to net these. Um, they are very sour. Uh, eaten raw, but I think they're delicious if you pickle them like olives or they're jellied or made into uh, wine type of products. So they're good, um, you know, in the where you're adding sugar to them or where you're pickling them. So both directions work with this. Persimmon is another one of our native trees. Uh, one of the drawbacks with Persimmons is it's a, a large tree eventually. Um, the fruit, again, um, has to be collected before it drops to the ground as well. And so um, I will say that our native persimmons tend to be smaller than the oriental persimmons. But if you see my note below, I'm going to say that the oriental persimmons in general don't have enough hardiness for us to even consider them. And so if you drop below 10 degrees in the winter, you're not going to want to have anything that has khaki uh, in its um, background. So you want to look for our native. 
Now, a note on native. Most of our natives are di dioecious, meaning that there's a male and a female tree for fruit. Um, we do, though, have a northern population that sets fruit um, without uh, fertilization, so they're parthenocarpic. And so you should be able to look for cultivars, and I have them, some of them listed here that are examples. So you only need one tree. Uh, persimmons are beautiful ornamental trees. Um, it takes a number of years uh, for them to, I'm going to say, anywhere from seven to ten years before they produce uh, their first crop. So again, this is another one where the crop um, has to drop. This is a fruit that, if I move to the next slide, this is a fruit that has to be blooded again, which allows the astringency to drop down to a tolerable level. And so again, this is a blooded fruit to, for the astringency. And so you want to wait until um, it is totally to the fullest ripeness. And I have a picture below of a commercial persimmon grower on his method uh, for collecting fruit. He has large screens that are placed underneath the tree so that there's no uh, ground contact with the fruit as it drops. Now as we come to a close, and I answer questions, um, I do want to mention that there's a lot of fruit that I have not mentioned that if you're in container production um, would be amenable. So I've listed several here. Um, for example, the passion fruits, uh, several of the citrus, um, pineapple guava, small bananas, um, all of these. One of the challenges we have is because um, uh, during winter production they need lots of light, you either need to have a mock-up like the Europeans do and having orangeries where there's a, you know, a room that has high light during the winter, or you have to place them where you are providing artificial uh, lights for these in a container. So just a little bit of a reminder, um, when you start getting into larger and larger plants, you start getting larger and larger kink containers here. And so I just provide... Um, this on the excuse me the dimensions of containers and that you can go online and use a conical frustrum calculator to calculate the size of a pot you need and so I'm given you know like an 18 by 18 by 18 pot is equivalent to a 25 gallon uh, container on there and so uh, anytime that you're doing container pots um, whether for your home use or whether you're doing it commercial production, uh, you have to be able to move those plants in and out. So this is just a reminder um, that containers can get rather sizable and that has to be considered in your plans um, if you're not going to have them in a high tunnel or whether you're bringing them in, um, in and out. That is the end of my presentation. And so if there are any additional questions in the box, um, I'll try to answer them. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And yeah, go ahead and uh, enter your questions in the text box. We are we have about eight minutes um, left, so we're we're well ahead of schedule. So feel free to type in any questions, and and Elizabeth, feel free to answer them as they come up here. Looks like we have one right here from Tom Woodburn. Oh, we may have lost Elizabeth temporarily. Nope, I got back. I oh, got okay. cut out somehow. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm here. I'm so, here. So it looks like we have a couple questions uh, in the box. One from uh, what varieties? Of, oh, he's asking JP what uh, varieties of honeyberries he's growing. Uh, Lisa M has a question. Are there any ornamental pawpaws? I'm not aware of any of them grown specific or selected specifically for ornamental value and I, to be honest I actually haven't seen any difference because I've, I've been to a number of variety trials of pawpaw and I really don't notice that much difference in their appearance just the fruit um, I, I actually have a couple questions maybe uh, that we can sure we can uh, answer while we're waiting for some more questions to come in. Uh, one of them, maybe it's kind of a two-part question,
but the first one that came to mind was um, I know that on campus there is some research related to perennial polyculture. So and some of the, the unusual fruit varieties you mentioned today are, are used in some of these research projects where multiple species of plant, of these fruits are planted in guilds in, in the same orchard rather than monoculture. Do you have any um, growers in southern Illinois who are, are trialing this production method? And if so, have, have you heard of any success stories related to, to this? I'm not aware of any commercial growers on that. I would kind of rate how... I grow them personally that way as well. Um, so I have, you know, some of the taller, you know, where you have things like walnut trees and pecan trees. Um, things can come underneath. Um, like I have my medlars underneath uh, black walnut trees. Um, I have my pawpaws under some black walnut trees and pecan trees. And so there is... Um, just from my own personal experience, um, the capability of doing that. And so in saying that, I can say with experience that pawpaws um, and medlars for sure uh, are tolerant of black walnut. And that might not be the case with all of these because I haven't trialed them against black walnut. So um, I am not aware of anybody who is mixing them and it doesn't mean they're not. I just don't know them. Um, mixing them with things like peaches and apples that are heavily, heavily sprayed usually, so, unless it's an organic production. So commercially, it, you haven't heard of any uh, adoption of that production technique? N not myself, no. Okay. And that, I, I kind of had a follow-up question with that in terms of harvest labor, particularly for some of these smaller berries that might be, would this be similar to, to blueberries and other smaller brambles? Um are there any specialized techniques? Uh, you mentioned a couple as we've gone through, but I was just sort of curious about that. Well, I, you know, it's like the honeyberry uh, because it has very good potential, particularly, um, you know, in the more northern for sure. I mentioned that we're not sure about it, you know, with leaf retention down here. They're very interested in developing mechanized because it, you know, has, has good potential. To the best of my knowledge, they don't have any mechanization. So again, most of these are going to be, you know, hand labor and some of them um, can be challenging. Uh, when you have things like gooseberries, you can just start at the base of the stem and just pull towards you into a basket and so you can do a quick raking. Um, other things like honeyberries don't actually pull, not honeyberries, sorry, um, um, uh, seaberry don't actually separate from the plant and you literally have to cut it from the plant which takes even more time. Uh, so yes, uh, a lot of these are going to have a labor issue just because they're not big enough crops that we've developed, you know, really good methods of harvest. Okay, excellent. So Andy has a question, which varieties are suitable for wet areas? I don't know if he's referring to um, a specific uh, one of these fruit categories we're talking about or maybe just in general yeah I'm trying to I'm running through my mind if any of these because most of these um, you know um, Aronia likes moist but it doesn't like wet so I don't um, uh, elderberry in its native is kind of one that is located near wet areas so I would probably say that it has potential uh, for wet um, I'm looking through my list of other, oh, I see uh, Teacup Farm is also supporting elderberry for wet as well. Um, but in general, following the guidelines that we would normally with tree fruit. Yeah, you know, avoid yeah, wet usually, areas. yeah, most of them are going to want to be, you know, uniformly moist, well-drained on there. Okay. Uh, Lisa M. asked the question, how long does it take for a pawpaw to flower? Um, I will say between five and seven years, depending on whether you start from seed or whether you start uh, from, you know, a tree, a grafted tree or, or already established tree. Okay. And then Jim asks, do you spray your trees or these other small fruits like you do apple trees? So maybe a comment about spray programs. Um, I don't, actually. Um, I spray my grapes, my apples, and my peaches. Um, I'm trying to think if I 
has sprayed anything else. Occasionally, um, there um, can be some problems on pawpaw, but that's more of a spot treatment. You can occasionally have some leaf feeders on pawpaws. It's a little more than you want it to be. Um, but I've never sprayed currants or gooseberries or honeyberries where I'm at. Um, you saw where I, the Chinese haw, I just took that out because that's too much of a problem. Um, never have um, sprayed my medlar. The quince um, was somewhat problematic. Well, it was problematic with fire blight. And you have to watch the goji berries because they can get um, you know, some leaf diseases like tomatoes do. So I'm, I'm going to say not as much as my apples and peaches and grapes, but occasionally. Let's put it that way. Okay. Excellent. So we have time for just a couple more questions, and there's two actual questions left. So one of them is, are any of these berries mentioned harmful to dogs? Um. Well, the question is whether they'd want to eat it, and dogs can be weird. So I would say that probably the one that might is if they eat a lot of um, unripe elderberries. And I don't know that they would want to. You know, um, there is uh, um, compounds that have cyanide, that produce cyanide. And they're much stronger in the stems that the berries are attached to. So, I mean, if they got a hold of a whole cyme and, you know, chomped on it, that's a possibility um, on there. But they, they'd, have to, they'd have to really get into it. Okay. Um, otherwise, I'm not aware of that issue. And Teacup Farm is confirming elderberry. Um, so Chestnut Hill, we'll, we'll go ahead and make this the last question. Uh, what are your thoughts for understory of pawpaw for production in a chestnut orchard? Uh, Teacup Farm is mentioning cranberry, but do you have any thoughts about that? Well, um, pawpaw can actually get to be somewhat sizable, so I don't know that it would stay, you know, in the understory. So, um, you know, when it first starts out, so... Um, yeah, I don't know that it could stay an understory plant because they 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 can get kind of sizable themselves. Um, if you're talking about you know like the Chinese chestnut or the Chinese chestnut crosses, they're not humongous trees like you know some of the you know chinkapins or you know, not chinkapins but you know some of the other types of chestnuts. So I would I wouldn't think that it would be a good idea. Excellent. And Teacup Farm was mentioning cranberry for, for wet areas. And, and oh, yeah. For yeah. Understory. Yeah, we didn't talk about that today, but that's very good. Yes, definitely. Okay, well, excellent. I, I really want to thank Dr. Wally for the fabulous presentation and sharing her expertise and some of these potential uh, niche fruit crops, maybe for both commercial application, but also maybe for, for homestead use as well. Um, and we'll, we will go ahead and get uh, Dr. Wally's email address in the follow-up email if, if anyone wants to send her information or comments about any of these um, uh, crops that they're growing um, themselves. So uh, I'd really also like to thank everyone for joining the webinar, and I hope you receive some information uh, that's going to help your small farm endeavors. Hope Hopefully, uh, maybe something you can even put in place yet for this upcoming growing season. So uh, just a final reminder, you're going to get one last follow-up email from us that will provide the link to this webinar on the Illinois Local Foods YouTube channel, where we house all the other uh, webinars from this season and previous seasons, as well as a short evaluation. Um, we're going to really look for your feedback to shape the future of our webinars. And with that, I really want to thank everyone for your support and feedback throughout this year's series, and we'll do our best to improve upon this year's offering. We really have a wonderful time producing and bringing this great information from our many great educator, ed educators throughout the state. So with that, have a wonderful uh, 2018 growing season, and we will see you again uh, in 2019.